Hello, my name is Magnus Peterson. This is my third tutorial on TensorFlow, and this is about Pretty Tensor, which is an add-on package for TensorFlow, which makes it a lot easier to create neural networks compared to doing it directly in TensorFlow. Most of the contents of this Python notebook is the same as tutorial number two, so I will just go over briefly the parts that are the same and then explain the differences in more detail. I recommend that you watch the second tutorial for more details on how to make a convolutional neural network. And just to recap, what we have is we have an input image and we take that into a convolutional layer where we have a number of filters and these go over the input image and do some processing, which I've explained in more detail in the second tutorial. And the output of the first convolutional layer are these 16 smaller images. And we then input those to the second convolutional layer, which has a lot of filters. And the output of the second convolutional layer are these 36 smaller images. And then we flatten all of these images to one long vector and we input that to a fully connected layer. And then we input that to a classifier layer and we get the classification out. Again, there's a lot more details in the second tutorial and on what convolution is. So we have a number of imports and we also need to import Pretty Tensor. It is quite straightforward to install and you can see how to do that on the Pretty Tensor web page. Then we load the data and this is still the MNIST data set and the training set has 55,000 images, the test set has 10,000 and we don't use a validation set. So these are the data dimensions and the image size is 28 pixels in both the width and the height. And there's one color channel for the grayscale and we have 10 classes, one for each of the digits, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, up to 9. Here's a helper function for plotting images, and this is exactly the same as in the second tutorial. And we can plot a few images from the test set so that we see everything is all right. So we have a 7 and a 2 and a 1 and so on. Now remember that the idea with TensorFlow is that we get efficient computation of mathematical graphs, and we also get automatic calculations of the derivatives because the TensorFlow system can use the so-called chain rule for differentiation. So the input to the TensorFlow graph is called a placeholder variable. And here we call it X and it is supposed to hold the images. So the shape is none and image size flat. So it is a two dimensional array and none means that it can have an arbitrary number of images. And so that each image is contained in a vector. We then reshape the data. So it becomes a four dimensional array or a tensor. So now the data can be input to a convolutional layer, which expects a four dimensional tensor. The true class of each image is held in this placeholder variable called Y true. So now we have to build the TensorFlow graph for the convolutional neural network. And first I'm going to show you how it was done in the second tutorial when we do the implementation directly in TensorFlow. So we need quite a few helper functions, which is going to make it a lot easier to build the graph. First, we need two helper functions for allocating new weights and biases. And these are used in all the layers in the convolutional and fully connected layers of the network. Then we have a helper function for creating a new convolutional layer. And it takes some input from the previous layer and the number of input channels and the filter size for the convolutional filters. This is also called the kernel sometimes. And the number of filters, this is really the number of output channels of the convolutional layer and then whether or not we want to use two by two max pooling. What is important to notice in this function is that it requires a lot of low level knowledge about how TensorFlow works. So here, for example, we have the shape of the weights, which is the filter size and the filter size and the number of input channels and the number of output channels or, or what I have written as the number of filters here. And then we create those weights and we create some biases and the biases are a lot easier because we just need the number of output channels. Then we create the TensorFlow operation using these weights and also something called strides and padding, which was explained in the second tutorial. And then we add the biases. And if we want to use pooling, we also have to add the TensorFlow operation for doing max pooling. And again, there's a lot of details in here about how TensorFlow really works. Finally, we add the rectified linear unit and then we return both the layer and the weights. This function doesn't have to be this long. I have made a lot of comments, so it's easier to understand. But still, it's a lot of details and we really don't want to care about all that because we want to focus on our ideas about building the neural network and not about how it's actually implemented. And of course, we have tried to make it more abstract and 
and easy by making this helper function, but still it can be better. But let's go through the rest of the helper functions. So the output of the convolutional layers are four dimensional tensors or rank four tensors. And the input of a fully connected layer must be two dimensional. So we have to flatten the output of the convolutional layer and we have helper functions for doing that here. And then finally, we have the helper function for creating a fully connected layer. And again, we have to allocate some weights and we need to know how that works internally with the shape and the matrix algebra and all that. And finally, we are done. We have all the helper functions we need and we can move on to the graph construction. So this is how we create the first layer, the first convolutional layer. And we take X image, which was the input images that were reshaped to four dimensional tensors. Then we set the other parameters so they are correct. So then we create the second convolutional layer. And as input, we take the result or the output of the first convolutional layer. And then we flatten the output of the second convolutional layer. And we take the flattened tensor and input it to the first fully connected layer. And then we take the output of the first fully connected layer and put it into the second one. And then we calculate what is called the softmax to get sort of a probability distribution of what the class might be. And then we calculate the cross entropy, which is used for optimizing all the variables in the graph so that it performs better at classification. And this, the loss, which we call the cost measure in the previous tutorial, is just the average cross entropy for all the input images. Not only did we need a lot of helper functions, we also had quite a lot of lines just to create the network with those helper functions. So let's see how this can be done much easier using pretty tensor. First, we have to wrap the input images to a pretty tensor object. We do this calling this function here, pc.wrap, with a X image. And then we take the pretty tensor object and create the graph from that. And what it does is that it takes a pretty tensor object and it calls a function. And I have split these into different lines, so it should be easier to read. So we have the object here and dot means we're calling the function in that object called cont2d. And this creates a convolutional layer with the kernel size or the filter size of five by five pixels. And the number of output channels is 16. And then we call it layer count one, which is the name of the layer. And we will get back to that a bit later. And this creates a new pretty tensor object. And then we can use a dot on that object as well. So we call max pool. And this adds a max pooling layer with the kernel size or the window size of two by two and a stride of two by two. And we keep adding layers by calling functions on these objects. So we have a whole string or sequence of layers that we are creating. So we have the input the first convolutional layer, max pooling, second convolutional layer, max pooling again. Then we flatten the four dimensional tensors to two dimensional. Then we have a fully connected layer. And then in the end, we have the softmax classifier. What that returns in the end is it returns two things. It returns a predicted class for each image and then the loss function. Okay, so let's look at the first line as well. And it says with pt.default scope, and then brackets and activation function equals tf.nn.relu. So what this means is that we are setting a default scope in pretty tensor so that everything inside the width block uses whatever we are setting here. So whenever we make a convolutional layer or a fully connected layer, they have an activation function, which could be rectified linear unit or sigmoid or something else. And instead of writing like this, in every single layer, we can just do it one time out here. Okay, so what we have done here in these few lines of code is the same that we did using all the helper functions built above. These functions, this one, this one, this one, and the graph construction where we make the layers like this, and this, and this, and this, and this, and, this. and we set up the classification layer and the loss function. And all of this can be done in just a few lines of code using pretty tensor. So this is great. It means you make fewer mistakes because it's a lot easier to do. And you can clearly see that the structure of the network follows the image that we had above, where we take the input image, send it to the first convolutional layer, send the result to the second convolutional layer, fully connected and the classifier. So the code we are writing in pretty tensor looks very much like the flowchart here.
So pretty tensor is great. However, there are a few things that are more difficult with pretty tensor than if we're doing it directly in TensorFlow. In order to get the weight for the convolutional layer, which we want to plot below, we have to call some slightly awkward TensorFlow functions and we wrap it in this helper function so it's easier to use, all right? What this means is that inside the variable scope with the given layer name, and these are the names that we set above, like here, layer count one, layer count two, and inside that scope, we want to get the variable called weights. And then we return that variable. And here we get the weight for the first convolutional layer and for the second convolutional layer. It's important to note that these are TensorFlow objects. So they do not actually hold numerical values. We have to do something like this. So we run the session using these TensorFlow objects to get the contents of those variables out. And these were more or less the only changes that we needed to make in order to use pretty tensor. So now we can minimize the last function as we would normally do. So again, we create a session and we run the initialization of all the variables. And then we have a helper function to perform the optimization iterations. And this is exactly the same as in tutorial number two. I have just copy and pasted the code. And then we have a helper function to plot some example errors. And again, exactly the same as in the previous tutorial. And the confusion matrix, also the same. And the test accuracy, also the same. So now let's perform the optimization. And again, this is exactly the same code as in tutorial number two. And the accuracy on the test set was about 11.7%. And these numbers might be different than in the second tutorial. And this is because of two things, first of all, there's randomness involved. So if you rerun this notebook, you will probably get a slightly different result here. And the second thing is that Pretty Tensor actually uses a slightly different way of initializing the variables than we had done in tutorial number two. But the result is mostly the same. So if we perform a single optimization iteration, then there's a slight improvement. This might actually sometimes be a slightly worse result because the weights in the model have been optimized for a fairly small batch number, and this might not generalize very well to the test set. But when we perform a large number of optimization iterations, the result on the test set gets better and better. And so after 100 iterations, it is about 83%. And we still have some embarrassing misclassifications like this five, and this six, and this six, and this nine, and five, and five. So at this point, the Network is still quite bad at classifying, so let's do some more optimization. We perform another 900 iterations, and then the accuracy becomes about 96%. And this one is a seven and a six, and these are all misclassified, and they are actually quite easy to recognize. This one is difficult. The true class is supposed to be a two, but it is predicted as a three. So let's try and perform another 9,000. So we have performed a total of 10,000 optimization iterations. And this takes, let's see, I think it's about, yeah, 11 and a half minute. And the result is that the accuracy on the test set is now about 99%. So this is supposed to be a nine and it's predicted as an eight. And this is a, the true class is a two and it's predicted as a seven. And I think we talked about this in a previous tutorial that I really think this looks like a seven. This looks like a nine, and I don't think it, the model should mistake this, but it predicted an eight, so it's not that good yet. And similarly, this is a six, and the model thought it was a zero, and this is a nine, and the model thought for some strange reason that this was a seven. So like before, we can print the confusion matrix and using all the same code as we did in tutorial number two. And now let's get to the visualization of the weights and the layers. So this is a bit different. And you saw above that we had to pull out the weights. Let us just go back and have a look. So we needed this helper function here, get weights variable. And this was slightly tricky because it uses a TensorFlow function, which was really designed for another purpose. And then we get the TensorFlow objects out here, and then we can use them below to plot the contents of those weights. So we make a helper function for plotting the weights and it takes the weight objects in, and then it runs the TensorFlow session with that object, and it gets the actual contents of those weights out. These are the numerical values, and then it plots them using this code here, and it is well documented, so you can read the source code in detail if you want to know how it works. 
So this is what the weights of the first convolutional layer looks like. And we have 16 of them here. And I would have liked to show you what it looks like when we apply these weights to the input image, as we did in the second tutorial, but it is more tricky to get the results of intermediate layers out when we are using pretty tensor instead of TensorFlow to implement the neural network. And if we go back and look at the pretty tensor code for defining the neural network, we don't really have any references in here. So we have the first convolutional layer here, and we want to output the result of that, but we don't assign it to any variables. So it is buried somewhere deep inside the TensorFlow computational graph, and we can't really get it out that easily. It is possible, but it's not too easy. And if you compare that to the direct TensorFlow implementation, so we assign the output of the first convolutional layer to this variable here, layer conv1, and then we can use that variable for plotting the output of the first convolutional layer. But we don't have that when we are using pretty tensor. So we just print the convolutional weights instead. We can also print the convolutional weights for the second layer. And remember that there were a lot of those. So we have here a set of weights and there are 36 five by five pixel filters here. And we have 16 sets of these all together. And we just show the second set down here. And if you want, you can plot the rest, but they are difficult to interpret what they're actually doing. So there's not much point in, in plotting the others. So the conclusion is that pretty tensor allows you to implement neural networks using a much simpler syntax than a direct implementation in TensorFlow. And this lets you focus on your ideas rather than the low level implementation details of how TensorFlow really works. This makes the code much shorter and easier to understand. You will make a lot less mistakes. However, there are some inconsistencies and awkward designs in pretty tensor. For example, you saw it when we wanted to retrieve the contents of the weights. And furthermore, it can be quite difficult to learn because the documentation is very short and it is quite confusing. So hopefully this gets better in the future. So pretty tensor can become even simpler to use. There are also some alternatives to pretty tensor, such as TF learn and Keras. I have made some suggestions for exercises, and I recommend that you go through these and see if you can solve most of them. Some of them are quite simple, and a few of them will take more effort. But if you try to solve them, you will become better at TensorFlow and Pretty Tensor. You can download this Python notebook by clicking on the link below the video.